Weathering the weather with Ed. Sometimes he's cranky, sometimes he's goofy, but he's always got a joke. Before I met him, I said meteorology. Hey, guy, that's not for me. But now I'm weathering the weather with Ed. Hi there. And today's episode is number 22. Is that not correct? I think it is. You, thank you. <laughs> it's part two of? Two. No, part two of what? How, how weather his changed history. Good enough, yes. Or in this case, how history changed weather. No, it's how Westwood changed, whatever. <laughs> we didn't change, all right. Now, since we're doing military battles, and we were, we, we, want, we have invited General Duckett here this afternoon, right? Right. right. Not yet, please. Not. He's, <laughs> I'm uh, getting ahead of myself. Ge you certainly are. General Duckett is half wabbit and half duck. Thither, Duckett, wave those eyes. All right. General Duggan will now define what military intelligence actually is. Take it away, General. Thank you, General Duggan. Very good. All thank right, you, General thank Duggan. You, thank All you. right, now go and go, go, go behind the tower go here. Go home. Go home, General. No, it's very good, General. So now everybody should know what General. It's also an oxymoron, such as, <laughs> such as <laughs> jumbo shrimp. Jumbo shrimp. You can't be jumbo and be a shrimp at the same time. Freezer no. burn. Huh? Freezer burn. Freezer burn. I didn't see anybody burning in there. No. All right. I know you're ready for this. Okay. You may feel feel free to interrupt. The weather and history are integrated topics. Okay, so we got the federal government off of us. Thank God. Because it's integrated. That was a little oppressive. Thank you. All right. Coexisting in a perpetual side-by-side -side dance. And don't forget, tonight's the finale of uh, Dancing with the Idiots, isn't it? Stars. Stars. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Although at this point, it's interchangeable. Although it could be that, yeah. Believe it or not, do you believe this? I, I, don't. I don't believe anything anymore. Major historical events have been drastically changed as a result of the weather. For example, Happen? from slave revolts to bubonic plague. Revolting. I remember her. Uh, Stan Mice, I'll tell you. <laughs> to the sound quality of a Stradivarius violin. Now show us this. And what is that, ladies and gentlemen? Go ahead and tell them. It's the smallest violin in the world. Oh, God. Playing but, the saddest hey, put song. Put me back in the picture. I'm playing my violin. Okay. Ah, there we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, good. Okay. Uh, stupid. What? Oh, weather has played a major out, major role in the outcome of hysterical events. Yes. Bagels? Bagels. Yes. <laughs> we, uh, we, we here at the deli serve bagels, not rolls. All right. This is the Bialy. You remember Mr. Bialy? Onion. I heard of him. A lot of onions. All right. So first one. Which, again, we're taking it from about.com. What? About.com. For instance, the Salem Witch Trials, of which I covered... Yeah, the they think I saw you then. You were there, too. <laughs> and the witchcraft altered by cold weather. This is unbelievable. All right. Quick. <laughs> Quick? Quick, I said, yes. Prove that you are not controlling the weather. Well. Sorry. Can you can you do it? What? Oh, just, just as such a question was put to countless people. One, two, three. They're right. I can't count them. They're countless. All right, they're right. There's too many. You're late on that. Sorry. Oh, mostly women. Well, what do you expect? You, We're the, the evil 15th ones. In the 15th through 17th centuries, the wrong answer was enough to cost them their lives. You should do that with the people on doing the weather. I don't know. No, that's true. All right. The only, the only catch was there was no right answer. Damn. Never is. <laughs> Not good. During the period of several, or bearing the period of severe weather, known as the Little Ice Age. I thought that was Little Anthony and the Imperials. I heard of him. Tears on my pillow? No tears on my pillow. On his pillow, <laughs> which which trials became ec epidemic in parts of Central and Southern Europe? Oh, go figure, huh? No, oh, you know. With changing the weather as a common charge. Go ahead. We, we bring it up. Start it with torture. Torture. A torture right there. Tor ah, in Europe torture. Figures. Torture seems to have touched villages whenever cold did. Is this alliteration? Torture's touched. Touch Tor torture. Yes. All right. Go ahead. Historian Wolfgang Beringer. What? Studied the European witch trials and found a correlation <coughs> between the peaks of witch prosecutions and accumulative sequences of coldness in the years 1560 to 1574. Is this statistically? Uh, 
been supported? I don't Correlations. Know. Thank you. 1583 to 1589, 1623 to 1630, and 1678 to 1698. From 1730 on, the climate became more stable, and so did the general mood. Isolated witch trials continued in central, central Europe until the 1770s, but nothing on as grand a scale as the heyday of the Little Ice Age. Well, leave it to Europe, right? Leave it to Europe. That famous paper tiger. <laughs> it's all from nice. paper tigers. Very nice. All right, now, we have uh, the Stradivarius, oh, this is for you, the Stradivarius violin sounds better, <laughs> that's how they did it, due to weather. Go ahead, Stradivarius. Is it? Yes. Go ahead. I drink to your health. Among musical instruments, the Stratus, Stradivarius has... Stradivarius, not the Stradivarius. It's not a cloud. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. The Stradivarius... Look up occasionally. Don't look at me. ...has no peer. Breathe deeply. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Violins crafted by the master Antonio Stradivari are renowned for their rich, powerful sound. For years, mu musicians and scientists have sought to unravel the secrets of the Stradivarius method. Just what is it that makes the Stradivarius so I resonant? Don't know. What is the method? I'll tell you. Thank you. There have been many theories. Well, give me one. <laughs> Some believe it was the formula for the varnish. Others say it was a secret Italian manufacturing method. Yeah, right. Modern climatologists have come up with a new explanation. Yes. It may have been the weather. And again, it may not have been. It may not have been. But, but it may have been. But weather changed history, it better be. All right, it sounds thank better. You. That this was way. certainly. Did you finish it? No. There's more if you'd like Go me to ahead. finish. Two researchers, Henri Grissino Meyer, a University of Tennessee tree ring scientist, oh, yes. and Lloyd Burkle, a Columbia University climatologist, Ooh. studied Stradivarius methods and published their conclusions in the journal Dendrochronologia. How about, cr let me see that. Can you Dendrochronologia. No, I don't think so. <laughs> let me check this out. I tried that. Dendrochronologia. Chronologia. Well, you're right. <laughs> I, thank you. And it's in parentheses. That's the scientific name of tree rings to you and me. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Who writes this? They believe it was the sharp dip in temperatures of the Little Ice Age. We just talked about that. Yes. That created the wood <laughs> that made the violin that so many revere. That made the gun that made the... Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Revere. Right, thank you. That was great. What's the next one? A violent storm gives the amazing grace song a boost. I think I should read that being Jewish. I didn't right. think there was. <laughs> I know. Amazing Grace is one of our best loved and best known hymns. I've been tired of it hearing it every time on TV. Every time something goes wrong. I'm amazed. Well, right. it's the a rabbi good song. Want. The, sto the story behind the song was inspired by a violent storm. John Newton. Oh, get this. A directionless man working on a slave ship. Well, why do you think he was directionless? He had no directions. He made a promise to God that if he were to survive, he would devote his life to his service, his in capital, because he meant his. Yeah. Ready, folks? Not yours, his. That's, I can't read with these. <laughs> he survived and made good on his promise. Newton would much later become a minister, writing Amazing Grace among his many recitations. Amazing he did Race? Not, what? He's amazing Grace. Oh, he said Amazing Race. Were you trying to get uh, trouble here? <laughs> Among his many recitations, he did not write the music because he was tone deaf, apparently. I don't know why he didn't write it. Not multi-talented. All right. <laughs> Civil War Camp Sumter Prisoner Saved by a Storm. Here we go. Thank you. This is, in, they're in the South, Sumter. I think it's South Carolina. Yeah? Yes. Yes. No, Georgia. Whatever. It's in the South. Well, there's Camp Sumter and there's Fort Sumter. Ah. Wrong state. Wrong state. Thank you. Thank you. The most notorious of the Civil War camps was Camp Sumter near Andersonville, Georgia. Built to hold 9,000 prisoners, the 16.5-acre site was chosen in 1863 because of its remote location and abundant food source. And Atlanta hadn't been located yet. So. That's true. Yeah. As the war was reaching its climax, can we say that we on TV? We love to say that on TV. <laughs> <laughs> camp As Sumter. As the war was reaching its peak. Are we love. <laughs> Can't no, even say that. Can't even say that. Well, the war was really going hot and heavy. No, that's not good either. <laughs> that doesn't work. All right, go ahead. Let's just move on. Let's move a little bit, yeah. Camp Sumter packed more than 30,000 men into the space designed this for a third as many. This is a little overcrowding, don't you think? Just a tad. No problem. They're sleeping through to a bed. They had no beds. <laughs> All right. Three to a floor. 
The stockade branch, which provided the only water for the inmates, was backed up by the stockade's pilings. The stockade branch? That's what they call it. Okay, good. Ugh. It became a putrid cesspool polluted <laughs> with hey, grease hey. from a cookhouse upstream. We've gone from the peak, the climax, to a cesspool? <laughs> Not good. That's how far, that's how low we can out. go. When's the divorce gone? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> the wastewater of laundry and human excrement. Those oh, who drank the water. Doo -doo, right? Huh? That means doo doo. Yes. Yes. Yes, in, in some polite terms. Uh, Those over. who drank the water were as likely to kill themselves with dysentery and diarrhea as to quench their thirst. Well, maybe they quenched it. How could they quench your surf with that? Surf? Your surf with surf? that garbage. Go ahead. Then one night, down. Sanders showed up. No, go ahead. <laughs> Downpour caused the stockade branch to overflow with such ferocity that it washed, washed away much of the camp's foul waste. Good. Several bolts of lightning struck near the prison, including one that hit a pine stump inside the stockade. At the base of the lightning-charred stump, a spring of fresh water emerged. The source was mo most likely a local spring that had been covered over during the construction of the camp, which the storm liberated. It didn't come from Maine? No. Oh, okay. Came to be known as the Providence Spring. That's in Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Thank you. <laughs> Is that it? Yep. All right, next. Let me have next. the next one. The Red Sky and Edvard Munch's The Scream Painting. Yes, he was looking at me and he screamed. All I right. often do. The Red Sky and the Scream is in the Scream? <laughs> it's all in the Scream title. It's said to have been an atmospheric event resulting from the eruption of the Krakatoa volcano in 1883, which is in the the Pacific Ocean, right? Is it? It's the Pacific, yes. Specific. A startled ghostly figure stands and screams beneath a swirling fire red sky. I thought that was the Mets. Sorry. <laughs> Usually, yes. Edvard Munch painting the scream is one of the most iconic <laughs> images from art. Its haunting sky was real meteorological phenomenon. Don't yawn, we're on. In 1883, the see, I told you, the rough of the volcano Krakatoa spewed ash. I think you just like saying that word. Into Krakatoa, it spewed ash. Got it? Into the atmosphere. As opposed to the ruder word. Yes. Dust and ash in the stratosphere interfered with sunlight and created drastic sunsets. How about dry, dramatic sunsets? Both. As far, as far away as northern Europe and the United States, one of which was depicted in the scream. This is because it put... Uh, volcanic material up in the atmosphere, very fine ash, and it, 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 and you get the red colors coming through better at early in the day and late in the day. So that was at sunset because he was still snoring at the sunrise. Oh, of course. You know, sunset quickly go. Sunrise, sunset. Augusta wind favored the Wright brothers. You know the wrong brothers. I know the left brothers. The left. Bro when is the doctor calling you back? <laughs> Next week. Good. What aviation pioneer was the first to fly in a heavier-than-air craft? Mickey Mantle. <laughs> oh, sorry. I don't think so. All right. Were it not for a storm and a poorly, poorly timed gust and of a wind. Poorly timed. Poorly. Time. Par how about poorly? <laughs> that works. The answer might have been Samuel P. Langley. That's Langley Field. Or Langley airport. Falls. He had, yeah. Oh. On December 8, 1903, Langley attempted to become the first man to demonstrate a working heavier-than-aircraft. That would be what? Some heavy person? <laughs> could Sometimes. Be, could be. Yes, go ahead. The press, military observers, and members of Congress lined the shore to witness the historic they event. Lied? They lied about the shore? <laughs> oh, they sorry. lied to the shore. Okay. Yes. They laid on it. Never, no, don't, no, they no, lined no, no, the no. shore. They lied. They lied. The machine was placed on a houseboat, pulled into the Potomac, and faced directly into the wind. There, aye, there's the rub. Go ahead. That's the problem. At 4.45, a pilot named Charles Manley signaled for crewmen to release restraining pins so the plane would be thrown into the wind by a spring-driven spring catapult. Or a string paddock, Paul. <laughs> or a string. You want to play paddock kick? We can yeah. get that, too. <laughs> All right. All right. Now <laughs> back to the show. Thank you. <laughs> But just as a pin was pulled, a heavy gust of Say wind sent the platform <laughs> lurching. Oh, no. Oh, darn. I hate when that happens. The aerodrome's rear wings collapsed and it made a spectacular nosedive into the water. That was not good. No, Did not usually. Did know how to swim? Meow. Sort of like the Mets. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so. 
This was probably one reason why not a single reporter showed up to watch the Wright, Wright brothers successfully fly the world's first I airplane the flyer up. nine I days showed later. Up. Yeah, I know. They took their picture with you. Thank you. That's right. I was on the wing going, don't take off. All right. Leave the demise of the Hindenburg blamed on weather. Back in the 1920s and 30s, dribblers? Oh, dirigibles. Thank you. Exhaust. Looks like the transportation of the future. So did the Mets. You, it, the era of the airship ended abruptly on May 6, 1937, when the Hindenburg burst into flames during a landing at Lakehurst, New Jersey. What, what do you expect for landing in New Jersey? Well, yeah, everything burst into flames there. What goes out? <laughs> four years, four years would assume that the craft was destroyed by a hydrogen explosion. No, most recent research stopped that. Most recent research <laughs> stopped that. Most recent research suggested that the Hindenburg was a victim of ordinary wane clouds. Yes, will you stop that? <laughs> As it came in a landing on Lake Grace, New Jersey, the ship, ergo, ergo, which was already delayed due to headwinds over Newfoundland. I hate those headwinds <laughs> over Newfoundland, I'm telling you. Was Just the as bad the, as the tailwinds. Yes. I was, una was unable to dock because stormy weather. <laughs> I like that song. Oh, thank you. It thank circled you. the airport for more than an hour waiting for the weather to clear. But a hark. When the Hindenburg passed through rain clouds. A what? Oh, a hark. <laughs> As the Hindenburg passed through rain clouds, the craft became negatively charged. Oh, no. You want to try that word again? Negatively charged. <laughs> Thank you. When the crew dropped the wet lines to dock, don't ever do this. They acted as a ground. The crew did. No, the lines. When the metal frame of the ship, ship earth is charged, the skin heated up and the highly flammable coating ignited. There you go, folks. Within 10 seconds, most of the ship was ablaze. By the time 34 seconds had passed, the mighty Hindenburg was a burning mass on the ground. Originally, they thought it was because they had used hydrogen. Yeah. But well, no. that's what happens when you build a plane out of a flammable material. Go tell Goodyear. Let that be a lesson to you. I'm not going anywhere. And an uprising in the sweltering heat summer of 1967. I feel Los Angeles coming on. All right. Here we go. Don't those dodges. Numerous studies have shown that high temperatures have an effect on human personality. Have an effect? Affect. Effect, whatever. Effect, yeah, not okay. affect. Right. Heat affects the levels of serotonin. Oh, no, not them. <laughs> Go ahead. In the brain, released in the brain, which can result in increased aggression. What? Yes. You yelling him? Go ahead. Yes, I am. All right. Disagreements that might cause a minor annoyance on a cool day have a way of escalating when the mercury rises. Right. It's also when common sense falls. Most riots have occurred in the United States, that have occurred in the United States, have happened when the temperature was between 75 and 89 degrees. What the hell are they going to do? The 20 below most of the riots occur. What are you Yeah, kidding? right. Yeah, right. It's too, too cold, cold to riot. riot. Let's go in and drink. <laughs> go ahead. Warm enough to increase tensions, but not hot enough to make people too lethargic to be bother bothered with fighting. I like lethargic, huh? That was our left fielder. Yeah. Couldn't catch a fly ball to save his life. Go ahead. I'm on camera. How you doing? Couldn't save his Don't life. Don't read that darn. The unseasonably hot summer of 1967 set off a spate of racially charged riots oh, sure. across the a country. A spate of racially charged. Nice going. <laughs> Thank you. We want to get this program shut down. A spade. A spade, yeah. Go ahead. Next you'll be found. Let's call a spade a spade. Go ahead. <laughs> we could do that. I don't think so. Across the country, including 164 incidents in cities such as Cleveland and Newark, but none would be as devastating in its long-term effects as the five-day siege in Detroit, which resulted in 43 deaths. You mean it wasn't Los Angeles? No, it was Detroit. When was Watts then? I don't know. All right, forget it. 43 Sorry, deaths, 7,300 arrests, and property damage of $60 million. They're lucky they did it then because it would be billions now. Of course. All right. Oh my God. Everything's this, billions this now. You've got a lot of sheets there yet. Yes, I do. We may have to do part three. We may have to do part right. three of two. The challenge of disaster in cold temperatures. Oh, this is not good. No, it's not good. Yeah. Uh, January 28, 1986, was especially chilly for Cape Canaveral, Florida. Yeah, especially? Right. Especially, yes. Where well, the average low in January is 47 degrees Fahrenheit. And for those of you listening from Europe or Canada, 8 degrees Celsius. The morning, the mercury had dipped, or oh, that morning, mercury had dipped at 28 Fahrenheit, minus 2 degrees Celsius. That's cold. Hmm. In a teleconference the afternoon before the launch, the, stop that, it's the engineers <laughs> from Morton... Thiokol, hmm, manufactured challenges, solid rocket booster, argued that the 
that the launch should be delayed. But no, can we listen? No. No, of course they not. They didn't have enough data to predict how the rocket motor seal would work in low temperature conditions. But does NASA care? No. No, they don't care. No, they Just don't get care. Get the thing off. In the end, the decision was made to launch away. Not a good decision. <laughs> Never. With disastrous con consequences. Cold weather combined with a defect. A defect. There you go. There we go. In a solid rocket booster, were to blame for the astronauts' deaths. Unbelievable. Unfortunate. You know, this goes to show you. Don't go up in a rocket. All right, we have what? They defected. All right, this is the bubonic plague. I remember her. Nice girl. She's a fun girl. A lot of rats with Very her. Very fun. Though. Yeah, a lot of fleas. Her, you can find her at the uh, downtown station on the T. Bubonic Lake. Go ahead. Uh -huh. Around the year 541, it began. What began? The bubonic plague. Oh. The first recorded visitation of an illness that would spread throughout the known world. Visitation? Visitation. You paid a visit. You paid a visit. Laying waste to cities, leaving so many corpses oh, piled up that there were not enough people left to bury them. This could be difficult. Very hard. Just, Painful, too. No, not for the... Go ahead. <laughs> the bubonic plague of the Justinian era ravaged the, the Roman who? Empire. Oh, the, oh, the Greeks. Yeah. They're the Romans. Greeks. The Romans. The Romances. Either or. Yeah. Killing as many as half of its inhabitants and changed the balance of power throughout the world. Yes, because I remember the South shall rise again. I know. You were there. I was there. What triggered this outbreak that so changed the balance of power was the weather. You see? See? See. You started it. See. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> Sometime ahead. around A.D. 530, a dramatic event occurred that blocked out much of the sun's heat for more than a year. That was, uh, that was Oprah Winfrey. No. Go, go ahead. Don't do that. <laughs> All right, sorry. Sorry, just kidding. Thank you. The effect on East Africa was a severe drought which ended suddenly with a deluge of rain. Not particularly good. Not usually. The drought killed crops, which unleashed, unleashed a chain reaction in the ecosystem. Oh, no, not the eco. Ecosystem. How about the ego system? No, ecosystem, ego. that's all you. Yeah, all right. No. <laughs> Gerbils and mice that fed on the grain died, and the larger predators that normally would eat the rodents also died. Like people. Yeah, probably. People. Snakes. Mm. As soon as the drought ended, however, increased rainfall brought plant, back, plant life back at a speedy pace, and the fast-breeding gerbils were able to replace their numbers because... What do you want them to watch TV? No, they, they, they would just live with the rabbits. Yeah, pretty much. You know what they do. That's where they got it from. That's what it's from. Because their larger predators took longer to spring back, the rodents were able to multiply. Yeah. Oh, they used tables? <laughs> they went forth they, and... They went forth and used <laughs> tables. <laughs> used tables. Little, little, yeah, yeah. Give me my calculator. Did some brief math. Yeah. For a brief period, East Africa was overrun by mice and gerbils, which were carriers of the plague, but immune to it themselves. How they came the, to Europe on merchant ships. Where the plague came from, though? What the heck were they huh? eating? It doesn't say where the, they carried it, but how did they get it? From the fleas. Oh. The fleas, the, the fleas. fleas. Thank you. <laughs> the fleas were around. All right. Yeah. Ahead. Well, fleas it's not like fleas are a new invention. No, they were developed. Go ahead. <laughs> That's it. What? All done. All right. Okay. Why don't you try to lose your eyesight on this... Uh, you want to try it? You kidding me? We got, oh, we got, oh, my God. You can do Normandy, the Civil War. Oh, we're going to have to continue <laughs> next time. All right. George is Washington crossing one. of the Delaware. Oh, I'm not going to read this. I don't get trouble I know you. It. You have look trouble seeing five feet from your face. People. You can't, oh. What, General? He didn't say anything. Don't worry. Da, 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 da. George Washington's crossing of the Delaware River. Yes. Washington's, uh, you know, everybody knows he crossed the Delaware. No, he didn't. Well, he tried to. It was the Potomac. No. Go ahead. Washington's plan required the crossing to begin as soon as it was dark enough to conceal their movements on the river. But most of the troops slow did not... Down, slow down, slow down. Relax. But most of the troops did not reach the crossing point <coughs> until about 6 p.m. Which, which was that daylight or standard? 90 minutes after sunset. Ah. Must have been... And when was this? January? December? December 25th. I would say uh, daylight hadn't even been invented then, savings time. I didn't think so. Oh, no. British had, though. Yes. They didn't get the rendezvous. You can't read that small print? I can read it. I just had to refine my place. Refine my place. Refine. All right, ladies and gentlemen. The weather got progressively worse, turning from drizzle to rain to sleet and snow. 
Wow, what happened to freezing rain? Didn't get any of that? Nope, just rain to sleet to snow. You know, sorry. Sleet is just frozen rain. Freezing rain is where you step outside and... You slide. And you, well, you eventually stop when you hit something. <laughs> well, something hits Only you. Only when you hit something. Yeah. Go ahead. It blew a hurricane, recalled one soldier. My God, it did. <laughs> it did. Uh, we're going to get off the air here. I get know. We're going to be pulled off the air. Those old canes, you know. Washington, okay. along with commanders John Sullivan, he Nathaniel Green, John Glover, cousin to Danny Glover. Oh, come on. <laughs> and and, and, uh, that and guy Henry Sol Knox. Who? Henry Knox? Henry from, Knox. From Knoxville. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, that Sullivan was related to Ed Solomon, the... Uh, not Solomon. The so oh, it's not an Ed Solomon show? No. <laughs> A really big show here. Okay. And here they are, the Beatles. You made me lose my place again. <laughs> Good. Stop that. You stop it. 241. Henry Knox crossed the Delaware River with 2,400 to troops. Twoops? <laughs> no, toops. Toops. 18 cannons, baggage, and about 50 to 75 horses. And a partridge in a pear tree, right? Yeah. One of them, well, too. It was Christmas, wasn't it? A couple turtle doves you as had well. had a few rabbis there, too. Yeah. What are we doing here? It's Christmas. Go ahead. They crossed at McCorkey's Ferry Inn. Not McCorkey's. McCorkey's. I used to like to go there. I know you did. Yeah. They used Durham boats, ferry boats, and other crafts. From Durham, New Hampshire? I think so. I know UNH got in on this. All right. I, of course they did. Three plug for them. Go Washington ahead. had given charge of the crossing logistics to his chief of artillery, the portly Henry Knox. Did they have to say portly? <laughs> Apparently. You got to get a picture of him in your head, you know. The boat sank. In addition to the crossing of large numbers of troops, most of whom could not swim. Not a good idea, then. Not usually, not no. Not good. He had to safely transport 18 <laughs> pieces of artillery and the horses to the move horses, them over the river. Why don't the horses swim across? I don't guess somewhere? the horses couldn't swim either. Oh, come on. They don't have to forge a, forge a river, whatever the hell. Forge okay. a river? You cry me a river. <laughs> All right. Build me a bridge and get over it. Just read it. Please. Knox wrote that the crossing was accomplished with almost infinite difficulty and that its most significant danger was floating ice in the river. Oh, no, that sounds like the Mets bullpen again. <laughs> floating ice? Floating ice, yes. In the river. Oh, they're in the river, all right. Go ahead. <laughs> One observer noted that the whole operation might well have failed, but for the stentorian lungs of Colonel Knox. The what? Stentorian? stentorian. Whatever, yeah. 54 seconds. Washington was among the first of the troops to cross, going with Virginia troops led by General Adam Stephen. Oh, phew. Virginia went with them, huh? Of course. Of God. Nice girl. Yeah. These troops formed a <coughs> sentry These line. Strips? Troops. Oh, troops. Around the landing area in New Jersey with strict, in strict instructions that no one was to pass through. The password was victory or death. Oh, that's good. <laughs> it's more than one word. Of course. Go ahead. The rest of the army crossed without significant incident, although a few men, including Delaware's Colonel John Haslett, fell into the water. Did he get 20 seconds? The amount of ice on the river <laughs> prevented the artillery from finishing the crossing until 3 a.m. on December 26th. Yep. The troops were not ready to march until 4 a.m. You almost don't have time. Nine the two other crossings fared less well. The treacherous weather and ice jams on the river stopped General Ewing uh, uh, two seconds. from even attempting a crossing that was below General Trenton. General Patrick Ewing, here we go. Da, 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 da. Let's go do Patrick. Okay. Oops, sorry. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Weather in the weather <laughs> with <laughs> Ed. Sometimes he's cranky, sometimes he's goofy, but he's always no, got a joke. <laughs> Before I met him, I said meteorology. Hey, guy, that's not for me. But now I'm weathering <laughs> the weather with Ed. <laughs>